So it's lovely to see you here. I want to add my welcome to Rachel's. Uh, Rachel's my wife. I'm Martin, I'm the vicar, I'm the pastor here. And uh, it's great, some of you are visitors for the first time. We'd love to give you a special welcome. But anyone who's returning after a little period of not being here, we'd love to welcome you too. And brilliant that you got out of bed. I was saying uh, before when we were praying, one of my favorite songwriters um, in the kind of 80s was a guy called Keith Green. He, he kind of said some very uncomfortable things. And he wrote this song. And in the middle of it, he said, and Jesus rose from the dead. And you, you can't even get out of bed. <laughs> well, you did. So well done, well done. <clears throat> so, Today is an amazing day as we focus on Easter Sunday, we focus on the resurrection. I wonder what it was that you were expecting in coming here today. I wonder what we're all expecting. Now the clocks have moved forward and the evenings grow lighter and the summer comes into focus. Who's pleased the clocks have gone forward? Yeah, oh, just some of you, okay. Well, I'm thrilled. What do we expect to do with the longer evenings. When and where do we expect to go on holidays? What weather are we expecting? You know, we can all be expecting one thing and yet experience something totally different, can't we? And we know that we've kind of expected things and then experienced things in the past that have been different. And so that comes to affect our sense of expectation of things in the future. How do we manage expectations in like that? Do we kind of lower them or raise them? How do you deal with the unexpected, with surprises, be they good or bad? And that's what I want to talk on today. What are you expecting? What are you expecting? All that happened in the last week of Jesus' life was totally unexpected for those around him. From the triumphal entry into Jerusalem days before, with the crowds proclaiming Jesus as King, to his gruesome death days later and then his burial, followed by his totally unexpected resurrection from the dead. Who would have expected that, especially after such a violent death? And for us today, the story of who Jesus is and what he's done for us is the same in his power. The death Jesus died was for all humanity's sin and wrongdoing throughout all the ages so that anyone, including me and including you, who really wants to know God and have a relationship, can. That's good news. That's the message of Easter. So many people have never given Jesus a second thought, have come to faith and are still coming to faith even today. And for them, that was unexpected. I've been with people who've done the Alpha course, who've been ardent atheists, who've been really angry that they encountered God because it shattered all their illusions that there wasn't a God, and I love it. What has happened in the cross and in the resurrection is actual history, it's testified to in history, and if you want to know more, if you're interested in knowing more about God, we run something called Alpha, or we'd love to talk to you. There's a little book at the back called Why Jesus You Can Take, or a New Testament that has the story of Jesus in. It's just as relevant today as it was then when Jesus was on earth. And, and the reactions of the people in today's society are the same as they were in Jesus' day. People often respond to the idea of God raising Jesus from the dead in two ways. He couldn't or he shouldn't. He couldn't because God's not real. How could he be raised if he was dead? But God is real and created the universe. So why couldn't he raise someone from the dead? Or maybe he shouldn't. He shouldn't because it's confusing to me. It challenges me because if it's true, then what's my response to this news got to be? Because I can't just ignore it. Well, let's have a look at some of the responses of those around Jesus after his death and burial. And as we do, maybe just see who you might identify with. 
So the first people to interact with this event of the resurrection were the soldiers and religious leaders. The tomb had been sealed up by religious leaders who expected the disciples to steal his body. Now I'm going to ask Roger to come up and read at this point um, our Bible reading and um, then I'll continue. Reading from Matthew 27. Have we got this on? And the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go to the tomb and secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes were white as snow, and the guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead. While the women were on their way, some of the guards came to the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders, they devised a plan and they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Thank you, Roger. Quite a plan, isn't it? The soldiers expected to guard the tomb without incident. They were people of authority. But later they were in, confronted by the reality of encountering an angel, the resurrection, and an empty tomb. However, they deliberately chose to ignore these realities. They denied them, being far more concerned with what others might think and terrified about the trouble they might get in for their failure to guard the tomb. Then there's the religious leaders who expected the disciples to steal the body, and that's why they had the tomb sealed up. But upon hearing the soldiers' account, they're going to be very upset. And they recognize that they're going to be proved wrong in all that they condemned Jesus for. So they deliberately also chose to ignore the truth. And not only that, they made a lie out of it. So despite the stark evidence which they ignored of the resurrection, they built up a false story to the contrary instead. But I want to put this suggestion to you that denying something has happened doesn't make it any less real or make it go away. We might bury our heads in the sand, but it's going to come up if it's true. So this question, how do I respond to the idea of Jesus rising from the dead. Just ask yourself that. How do I respond to the idea of Jesus rising from the dead? Then we had this second group, the women. Mark 16, verse 1. It says, On Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll the stone away for us from the entrance to the tomb? <coughs> so these ladies went with a clear question and a natural expectation in their minds. Jesus was dead in a tomb, and they come to anoint his body with spices, 
and they fully expected everything to be as it was when they saw the body previously. Which is why they were wondering, who's going to roll the stone away? But, verse 4, as they arrived, they looked and saw the stone which was very large. I like how they put that in. It wasn't just any old stone. It was a very large stone. had already been rolled aside. So question to you. How would you have reacted in that moment? How would you have reacted upon seeing that? Put yourself in that situation of intense grief and trauma. You've seen the most incredible person ever who went around doing good, healing the sick, delivering people of demons, restoring the dignity of people, bringing the outcast into society, <coughs> into society of which one of them had been falsely accused and then he was executed as a murderer would be. How would you feel at that very moment going to the grave of a loved one in all that raw emotion you were feeling just a few days after the burial, seeing it in effect vandalized, seeing an open grave? Verse 5, when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked or alarmed. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. And the women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. These were strong reactions that they had to an unexpected empty tomb. And an angel sat there. This was not what they were expecting. And despite what the angel told them, they were shocked, alarmed, frightened, confused, at the reality in front of them. They couldn't, this couldn't or shouldn't have happened, but something has. So what do they do with it? So when you hear this story, does that shock you? Does it alarm you? The fact that the resurrection might be true. Then we have Peter, a key follower of Jesus, one of the disciples. John 20, verse 2. It speaks of Mary Magdalene who came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, who we know is, is John. And she said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they put him. It's interesting that both sides of the coin here, both sides think someone's done something with the body. The disciples think the authorities have and the authorities think the disciples have. Verse 3, so Peter and the other disciple, John, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And he bent over and he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along beside him and went straight in the tomb. And he saw strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And in Luke uh, 24, 12, it says that Peter went away wondering to himself what had happened. Simon Peter was in a real quandary. He was a fisherman, used to hard life. He was a risk taker, but he was also a realist. He denied knowing Jesus three times, three days before, and he'd wept bitterly in his contriteness. But this, this was seemingly beyond him. What had happened to the body? Where had it gone? Who could have taken it? And why? And what was to be gained from a, a, a grave theft? And then, in the back of his mind, there was this slippery remembrance of things that Jesus had said that he, he, he couldn't quite grasp, it eluded him, but things about death and rising from the dead, what would this mean for him? How would he bring closure to all he felt? And what would this mean for the future of the disciples and all that Jesus had spoken of regarding things to come? Peter faced the facts 
saw the empty tomb, but just didn't get it. He didn't understand. And I want to ask this question to you. What about us? Can we see there's a reality in all of this, in who Jesus is and what he's done, but we can't quite grasp it. We don't quite understand. And then fourth, the other disciple who ran to the tomb, John. He later became an apologist, someone who writes in the defense or justification of something. And he wrote this gospel in order to bring the evidence of Jesus' life and ministry. And in his writing, he brings together not just an account of his teaching, miraculous and supernatural events that occurred in Jesus' ministry, but logical argument as to his humanity and his divinity too. <coughs> this logical man, John, is also not sure how to engage with this unexpected event. It shouldn't be happening, yet it was. This was not logical or reasonable, and I'm sure his mind was racing over the various possibilities of what might have happened here, from the body being stolen to what Jesus had said and alluded to about resurrection. But it says in John 20, verse 8, finally, the other disciple, he, who'd reached the tomb first, also went inside. And then it says this, he saw and believed. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. In that moment, John saw and believed it had happened and then later understood. He believed even though he didn't understand how it could be connected to the scriptures. I think this is an interesting statement. You don't necessarily have to understand everything to believe in something. Would you agree with that? You don't have to understand everything to believe in it. I don't have to understand the law of gravity before I feel its impact. I can feel its impact then work it out later. To believe in Jesus, to believe he died and rose again, to believe that he's now alive, that he can forgive our sin can be believed in without having to fully understand where it all comes from in the Bible. That clarity can come later. That's why this is good news. It's open to everyone, no matter how clever or how unlearned we are. That's why children believe, and they believe wholeheartedly. And sometimes it's those of us who are so clever, we struggle to believe. When someone falls in love, you might just say, well, how do you know you're in love? And they just say, well, I just know. I believe I love them, despite really knowing them. The clarity of that love, however, becomes clearer and unfolds as you treat each other in different ways and grow together. And John was willing to accept at face value something was happening here. Something that was bigger than him. Something bigger than his understanding. And that in believing the understanding would eventually catch up with him. And then finally, Jesus reveals himself to Mary Magdalene on her own. John 20, 11. Now Mary stayed and stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, and one at the head, one at the, one at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away. See, again, it's like, who's taken him? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. She never expected to be face to face with angels talking to them. And she's so distressed, she's not taking in what's actually happening. And then the most incredible, unexpected thing happens. Verse 14, at this she turned around. And she saw Jesus standing there, but did not realize it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Why, who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. 
Have you ever had that encounter with someone? I mean, it could be on the phone, but actually an encounter with someone who speaks like they know you well, but you just can't place them. My dad often had this. I've told you before, my dad was a pastor, and I'd be with him at different times, and people would come up, Dennis, Dennis, it's great to see you. And they begin chatting to him. He says, yes, wonderful to see you. And he'd chat away with them for a few minutes, and then we'd walk away, and i said, Dad, who was that? He said, I'm no clue. I'm no clue. She knows Jesus, yet as she sees and talks to Jesus, she fails to see who she is, who, who he is. Last time he was beaten and bloodied. She thinks he's the gardener, but this couldn't be Jesus because she didn't expect that. And so her mindset has to change in order for her to be able to benefit from that unexpected encounter with Jesus being offered to her right there and then. And I want to put it to us that to meet Jesus, to recognize him, requires a change of mindset in order to acknowledge who he is. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned to him, toward him, and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And on hearing her name, Mary's eyes and heart were open to see Jesus was actually there with her. And it it's at that point it becomes clear and the fog lifts and she recognizes his voice. It's too good to be true, but it is true. Jesus is alive. He's risen. It is true. And, you know, you may have been here. You may have been in life encountering Jesus, encountering God, and never realized who he was. Sometimes we sing this song called, All my life you have been faithful. God is with us. God never leaves us. The question is, do we recognize who he is? Mary called, was called by name by Jesus, and she recognized. And I believe he's calling you by name today. He's speaking to you. What we can see in these events is that what everyone expected about Jesus and what he do was different to what God actually did. Even for those followers of Jesus who'd seen Jesus do the incredible things he had, who'd seen the impossible happen, had seen the supernatural God at work doing things out of the normal, out of the natural, beyond their experience and expectation. This was too much to comprehend or understand. And so they lowered their expectations and they put God in a box, back into the natural realm. I wonder if we limit God. I wonder if we put God in a box when we don't understand. We don't wait for him to show us what he's doing. It's a wonderful verse that says in the Bible, God is working everything together for the good of those who love him and according to his purpose. What I love about that, it's for the good of those who love him. If you want all that rubbish stuff that's happening to you to work for good in your life, love God and he'll do that for you. What are you expecting with God? Have you boxed God in? Have you buried him in a box with little or no expectation? You may be here today feeling overwhelmed and powerless about your life or situation, about work, health, a health issue, finance, a relationship issue or a family issue. <coughs> you might be disappointed with life and with God. And so what you've done is you've absolutely lowered your expectations. You may be addicted to something. You may be in despair and wonder if God is really real. You may have no strength to go on or feel you've messed up so much and you're so ashamed of yourself that you've lowered your expectations of life and the future to conform with your current situation. You may be a Christian. You may be totally unchurched with no real faith and you might have lost hope. 
You may even have been staring Jesus right in the face, yet missed what he's doing right under your nose, not realizing that he's here with you. The thing is this, God is bigger than anything we may be facing. And he's doing something different to what you might be expecting. What God wants us to do in our life is not depend on ourselves, but depend on him. God wants us to know him. God wants to fill us with his life and his presence and power and hope. God wants to make that resurrection power known in our life. Let's pray. There were different people in that story, those who denied and made up their own story, those who were confused and frightened by it all, those who saw it but didn't get it, those who saw it and believed but didn't fully understand, and those who had their eyes and hearts open to see. And I don't know where you're at, but God wants to meet you this morning, whoever you are, and to show you his grace and his love. And if you're here and you've never known God, you've never connected with God, you've never known what it is to meet Jesus. I'm going to pray a prayer. And I just want you to echo it in your heart. It's a prayer that is inviting God into your life. It's a prayer acknowledging that we mess up. It's a prayer acknowledging we need Him. If you want to pray that prayer, just pray that with me now. Lord God, Thank you for the message of hope found in Jesus. Thank you that, Jesus, you came to this earth. You really came. You lived. You died. You took my sin and my shame on the cross. I deserve to die, but you went in my place. And you were buried, but because you are righteous, you are all that is good, you took my place. And that sin of mine couldn't keep you in the ground. And you rose again. And now you're offering me new life. And I invite you, Lord, to come to my life right now. I open my life to you, Jesus, and I say, welcome. I want to see. I want to believe. And then, Lord, help me understand this day I give you my life and I welcome you in, in Jesus' name. And for others of us here, you're in different situations. I just want to pray now. Holy Spirit, would you come among us and would you move in resurrection power to meet that need? <coughs> First of all, Lord, we need to see you. We want to know you. Open our hearts and eyes to see how much you love us, to see the greatness of your forgiveness. Restore hope. Fill us with hope again, that we would overflow with hope. And Lord, we bring that need to you. We bring that worry to you. We bring that impossible situation to you. We say, Lord, have your way. Bring deliverance. Use it for your glory. Thank you that you are powerful, that you are calling my name. And I say, Lord, here I am.